Does an expensive bike make you faster? Is a hardtail a fast track to better skills? Are these statements true or false? Well, in this video, we're going to dive into the myths of mountain biking and set the record straight so you know which way is up. Let's do it. So the first myth we're gonna bust is, does a hardtail make you a better rider? Well, maybe, but it's not necessarily true. Most riders do start out on a hardtail, but mainly because, well, it's cheaper. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with riding a hardtail um, for that reason or any other. In fact, quite the opposite. A hardtail can ensure you learn great riding techniques because you have to become the main suspension part of the bike. You're learning to use your body and soak up all the hits on the trail. Uh, if you're only relying on the suspension and all that tech, not only could you be developing, well, bad riding te techniques, but you're probably going to be in for a bit of a, well, world of pain, should we say, when the bike tech runs out and the only thing that can save you uh, is that invaluable hardtail experience. So it's definitely worth thinking about the bonuses of riding that hardtail. Uh, but just start riding a hardtail won't automatically give you those necessary skills, nor is it the required way to build those skills. It's often just more of an accessible pass into mountain biking because of that price point. The thing that will give you the hardtail skills is to get on the bike and put the time in. Uh, and if you take the time to understand the technique of using your body to soak up those really big hits on the trail and work with a bike, then nothing will stop you progressing. Does the more expensive bike make you better? I think we've all heard of the um, dentist bikes, you know, those super expensive bikes with all the bells and whistles that apparently only dentists can afford. Uh, and the stereotype goes that these doctors of dentures don't know what they're doing on the bikes either. It's just all money and no idea. Actually, I do have a dentist with some incredible bike skills, but that's incidental um, and it makes it a lot easier to stomach that he's got such an, a range of incredible bikes. We also see those rippers who ride old bikes with no technology to speak of, but disappear into the distance on the trail, leaving you for dust. Their skills clearly outweighing the lack of ability in their bike they ride. Just like any sport, it's about the actual individual on the bike. It's not about the tool. It's always going to come down to the rider, not the equipment. But having nicer stuff can be good too. Uh, but it won't make you any better and never and never is spending money the solution to getting all those techniques. This is basically the counterpoint to my note about hardtails. You can't buy through the problems a trail will throw at you. Learning how to handle those challenges is where the fun is to be had. Do you need the newest tech to keep up? The industry that we all know and love also loves us and our money. It sometimes feels uh, very difficult not to get caught up in all the jazz of the new tech and gear because they market it very, very well. But really, how much better can the newest forks really be? At the end of the day, they just go up and down. Does this year's tire compound make that much of a difference to how you ride than last year's? It's just black rubber. Um, some people need to have the latest and greatest, and we get that. Someone has to keep the industry alive and well, and thank God for those people spending the money. But for many of us, that just isn't an option. We've got to run the stuff we've got. Run what we brung attitude, if you like, is all you need uh, if that's your situation. And that is plenty good enough because it's not all about having the best stuff. At the end of the day, that's not why we get into the sport. The trinkets, they're very, very nice to have, but they're not necessary. It's about having the best time. That said, don't be too cynical about emerging tech. Um, there are very clever advances happening in the sport and many of the products out there are very useful and can make a big difference to everyone's ride. Uh, I'm just gonna reference the dropper post there. So it isn't a case of the best tech, it's a case of realizing where the gains are to be had for you and in focusing in on what your next important purchase is gonna be and in that way, you can improve your bike in the best way for you possible. Drop a post, anyone? Lighter is better. Oh, bear with us for a second, because we're going to talk about e-bikes. Yes, there's an EMBN and e-bikes have their own place. Blah, blah, blah. But 
there's one aspect of e-bikes that once you've ridden one is very obvious. Their suspension systems work very well with the added weight of the battery and motor. Now, that's really interesting. Normal mountain bikes have also been tested by pros to use extra weight to help suspension performance. So actually adding weight to a bike to make it act differently down the trail. That balance between sprung and unsprung mass makes all the difference when railing through a turn. The improvement generally feels like a very planted setup, which is confidence building and often a very quick option. And it's the first thing you notice when you get on an e-bike because you're not expecting it to feel great in terms of performance. We've seen some of the top downhill race teams playing with this, as well as people like Chris Porter from Mojo Rising, who helps me out with suspension and build on my random tandem so he knows his stuff, uh, which definitely shows there's something to it. So, lightweight is best? Not necessarily. Your bike, it has to be carbon, or does it? Alloy is cheaper, and look at what has been winning a bunch of World Cup downhill races over the last year or so. Uh, it's become the privateer purchase choice on the World Cup level too. It's an alloy only common sell. That's right, alloy bikes are winning World Cup downhills. Now, every material has its strengths and its weaknesses. We've all been told that carbon has the advantage everywhere, but it doesn't really. It may be better in some areas, but for most riders, it isn't an essential. And it can be a toss up even for a pro racer too, like we've seen on the World Cup scene. Uh, it doesn't make as much difference as you'd expect. Though it really depends on the kind of race. Uh, XC racing really does need a bike to be super lightweight. Um, but a downhill bike doesn't need it so much, and nor does an enduro. So aluminium, it's coming back. There are brands like Common Sal, Nikolai, Lightville that have kept the alloy dream alive, refusing to go carbon uh, as a material to use for their bikes. Um, it's not to say that carbon is bad. It is light, it is strong, and it does perform incredibly well. But if a barrier to you getting the new bike is that you can't afford the carbon, then step back down and look at the alloy option. However, alloy, steel and titanium all have a place in high-end area of mountain bikes. So don't let carbon be the only thing you look at. Look at all the different materials and see which bike suits you best. The next myth, you need a certain bike to ride certain places. To begin with, we had a very limited choice of mountain bike designs. Those early bikes in the early days of mountain biking could handle anything and everything. That was the whole point. These days, we have so many options of bike that still fit well under the uh, mountain bike umbrella, but the new generation of NTBs are more specialist in their design intentions. So it will be easy to think that you need a certain type of MTB for a certain terrain. That for isn't really wrong. However, it's sort of come full circle, especially with the new crop of trail and enduro bikes that are just incredibly capable. They can nearly do anything you ask of them. They actually could probably do anything, but you just have to adjust your setup to suit the scenario and suddenly that bike can handle it. Uh, take this for example, very recently, Sam Hill raced in the World Championships downhill. Uh, he came sixth overall on his enduro bike. Take this, a short travel 29er could probably do an enduro race at EWS level. Uh, and at the World Cup races, using cross country bikes that are handling such technical terrain now and such difficult riding skills that you could take them out onto a much more difficult and aggressive course that back in the day, you just never would have done. It's all a balance. If you go to the extremes of bike categories like fat bike or a full downhill rig, then you will find big limitations on what terrain they can can handle, but they will handle the intended terrain very, very well. The fact remains though that trail and enduro bikes are more adaptable and can handle pretty much whatever you throw it at, or throw at it. You need all the accessories to ride. Not true. Back in the day, we'd wear jeans and a t-shirt and trainers on our feet, and we'd be happy we had shoes at all. Hang on a minute, who wrote this script? How old do you think I am? Well, shoes definitely were a necessity, but any old shoes would do, really. A pair of plimsolls. Thing is, it's nice, but not necessary to have all the latest clothes made from all the highest tech materials and shoes that are specifically designed to clip right into some high-end pedal. Simple, informed decisions about accessories and gear is all you need to do. So, 
Think about weather conditions, hydration, nutrition. Cover those and uh, you're only a multi-tool away from everything you need. The rest is accessory and fun and a maybe. Riding faster is better. Fun and flow is good too though, Neil. Yep, yeah, Neil, you know I'm talking to you. To be fair, Neil does uh, enjoy a flow trail these days. Uh, and, but speed is so much fun, but so is getting your flow on. You know, the feeling when you're hitting every corner just right, skipping along sections perfectly. It may not be super fast, but it's hell of a lot of fun. And that's what this is all about, riding bikes. Uh, and unless you're racing, who really cares how fast you're going? Strava be damned. That's right, next time you're riding and try turning the speed dial down a little bit and see what difference it makes to your experience. Chances are you'll actually start noticing lines and obstacles that you weren't even seeing before at your blistering pace. They just weren't an option. The flowy approach can bring new opportunities out on the trail uh, and a lot of enjoyment. Faster isn't always the way to win the day. Bike setup is completely subjective, but sometimes it's just wrong. We've seen it all, people riding with backwards forks, not those Manitou ones that are made to look like that, um, or people with their saddles too low or too high, with tire pressures as low as 10 PSI, which does my head in, or as hard as 60 PSI, but in completely the wrong situation. There is, I guess, conceivably times where those pressures could maybe work, but it would be rare. Sometimes your bike setup can be subjective and even quirky, but sometimes, it's simply wrong. Sometimes you're even putting yourself in danger. If you think your setup could be tweaked, then watch a few more of our videos um, and get some helpful advice uh, and decide what's best for you. There's some big changes you can make to your bike by just moving the bars or adjusting the brakes, longer stem, shorter stem. All these things make a big difference. So experiment for sure, but it's important to learn why you're making those changes uh, and do they or don't they work uh, given the situation you're riding in. Thanks for watching and click just here for more GMBM videos. Hit the globe to subscribe and don't forget to help others find this video by giving us a thumbs up like. See you next time.